Hey everybody, I just wanted to let you know that this episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by Cobalt Press. Cobalt Press are the makers of many fine gaming products. I am talking about the incredible Tome of Beasts, the incredible Creature Codex, the incredible Midgard campaign setting, and now the amazing Deep Magic series for 5th edition. Do you want to learn the secrets of elven magic? Do you want to blast your enemies with battle magic? Do you want to build cunning mechanical servants with clockwork magic? The Deep Magic series from Cobalt Press has all this and more for 5th edition D&D. Time magic, rune magic, illumination, nearly 20 PDFs with new ones coming out all the time time from Cobalt Press. You know them, you love them. They play test their stuff, they edit it, they put in great art, and in this series you'll find new magic schools, sorceress origins, warlock patrons, feats, spells, magic items, and so much more. The best part is they're quite, quite inexpensive. You are definitely going to want to check this out, and you can buy the ones you want that are going to fit your world. Pick up the Deep Magic series for 5th edition at www.cobaltpress.com. You know what? You can even leave out the www. Just go to cobaltpress.com and check out Deep Magic. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intracasso. On the show, I am chatting with Stephanie Bryant and Toby Strauss. Both are incredible, incredible game designers. And we are talking about Toby's new Kickstarter for Jinkies, a game that Stephanie is helping him out with doing a lot of the awesome organizing, production management, and that sort of thing. And we are also going to be doing a super duper awesome deep dive about structuralism in games. Uh, This is a really cool topic and there aren't a lot of people talking about it. Stephanie and Toby are structuralism nerds and they turned me into one too. So let's get to our conversation with them. Okay, everybody, now I am here with two amazing game designers and people that I love to talk games with, or at least that's true about one of them. Toby, we'll see. All right, here we go. Uh, Stephanie, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? (laughs) So I'm Stephanie Bryant. Thanks for having me on the podcast, James. Um, I've been on this podcast once before, talking a little bit about my book uh, or my game, Threadbare RPG, where you play a broken toy in a broken world. Um, My day job is Scrum Master for Roll20, so I pretty much live, eat, sleep, and play, and play, and play tabletop games. And, of course, new to Tabletop Babble, uh, Toby, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? So, hi, yeah, my name is Toby Strauss. I make games. You know, I'm a hobbyist. I'm actually a, a public school teacher here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I was a contributor on Stephanie Bryant's Threadbare. I was a finalist in the 2016 200-word game challenge. That That's a fun project and a weird one. Glad to talk about it if you want. And super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Listen, if if you offer me the chance to talk about something weird, I am definitely going to take it, Toby. <laughs> Buddy, everything <laughs> that I do is weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I definitely want to get into that. And I also want to make sure right here at the top that we're telling people you are here uh, in at least partial capacity to talk about Jinkies, which is a new Powered by the Apocalypse role-playing game that is on Kickstarter right now. People can go check it out. Uh, and as we talk about our game design, careers and uh, Jinkies itself. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about what the game is overall? Okay, so Jinkies is a Powered by the Apocalypse uh, game that is based on the 1970s adventure mystery cartoons. Uh, Most of these were made by Hanna-Barbera, and they were things like Scooby-Doo or Josie and the Pussycats, uh, Speed Buggy, if you're really geeky about your old cartoons. Inch High PI, which uh, Steph, Steph and I were joking about the other day. Uh, that's an odd one, but it was one of the mystery cartoons. And basically, I took those old cartoons that I grew up with and 
made it into a apocalypse hack and it played well enough that we're we're publishing it. That's really, really cool. And Stephanie, you are one of my favorite game designers out there. I really love talking with you. And when you brought this idea and said like, oh, we should talk about this game, um, you had a couple of great things that you really loved about the game that you thought we could talk about. Um, You know, you talked about building structuralism right into the game in a way that makes this beautifully like an old school Hanna-Barbera cartoon. So uh, could you go into that a little bit more about how the game is structured and uh, why you think it works great for the theme of Jinkies? So this is uh, when Toby started designing this game. uh, It's gone through a lot of iterations, of course. And the the moment when I knew that it, it was going to be amazing was when he added in this this structuralist take in it which is clever and beautiful and elegant. And I just, when I, when, when he did that, I saw it and I was like, this, this is the thing. And every time I talk to people about this game, I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. People get, you know, frustrated with, with certain things in mystery games and, and, uh, and investigation games. And the thing that Toby did in this game takes that away and I'm going to let him tell you what that is cuz it's so cool. Okay, so so the idea for the the structuralism of the game uh originated with an idea that I had as a dungeon world hack and it was called modular dungeons. And I I had this epiphany when I was playing a dungeon world game uh on the fly uh at a convention in Utah. And and I'm just like, "You know what? So they they had to decide, do they go left, right or straight?" And and I had this moment where I said, you know, it doesn't matter. Who cares if they go left or right or forward? Do I want the next room to be the correct room or not? And and that was sort of, and, or not even the correct room, but but the room they're looking for, or maybe a different room that's interesting in a different way. And nobody liked it. Nobody <laughs> nobody liked the modular dungeon idea. And I threw it away. And then, and then when I made Jinkies uh, a few months after that, I said, you know, it, it's got to work for this because if you watch these old cartoons, they follow a five act structure and you expect this structure. It, it, it's just like, uh, you know, the hero's journey where you expect that if you're watching like Lord of the Rings or, or some other epic movie, you expect the structure of, of a mystery show to be the same. And it's always the same. So you start out where... Uh, the gang arrives at the location and they start meeting people. They find out about the mystery. There's nothing supernatural occurring and there's an act break. There's always an act break at the end of it because that's the part that happens before the commercials. So, you know, in the first act, it will terminate when uh, they experience the ghost in some way. They'll see, you know, a reflection or they'll hear something. Then they'll go to the next act where they're investigating. Then they'll go to an act where they're being chased by the bad guy. And then you have the, the you know, uh, the denouement where, where they unmask the bad guy and, uh, and say who did it and why. And, and you expect that. So I baked that in. And the reason it works is the mystery adventure cartoons of the 70s were never about the mystery. Uh, for for a number of reasons, they were really about the cast and they were about the adventure. So the mystery itself, like like you couldn't watch Scooby Doo and figure out who did it until Velma just told you, because they don't give you enough clues, and that's fine. So when I run the game, like players tell me what the clues are. I you know I I just give them a bunch of suspects, and at the end, because of the structuralism that that we all bring to the table. If I'm following the act system, they will come to a conclusion that mostly makes sense and that the players are satisfied with. And I I can't think of a single playtest, and I've done probably 40 or 50 of them, where the players were unsatisfied with the end of the mystery. And what I think is fascinating is how when when he does these playtests, players are satisfied with the with the end of the mystery and they're surprised. <laughs> right or or even better even better is when they complain and they go you know what like 
Like, I know it was Old Man Withers, but it really should have been uh, Mr. O'Houlihan. And you go, you're joking, right? I don't have <laughs> Mr. Withers did it written on this. Like, All right. Because they came up with it themselves. Right. Which, which is also kind of, kind of part of what I think makes Jinkies work really well as a, uh, a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Because it is very much play to find out. Uh, it's a mystery, but the players are making the mystery at, along with the the GM. The GM is called the animator. Uh, the animator and the players, they're collaborating on this. This is like the next evolution of, I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, right? You let the player's paranoia kind of build what's happening behind the scenes for you as the players discuss like, oh, maybe the Lich has this powerful artifact and that artifact, like this is uh, an open acceptance of that idea almost, which I really, really love. I think that's great. Yeah, I, I, I think it plays really well. I think what's really been gratifying too is that it's played well with with players who aren't great at like like they're new to gaming and it has run well with GMs that aren't me which you know that that's something that you bring when you're a game designer is hey this plays really well with me but is is it just that I'm good at running it or is it a good game and it has played well with other people one thing that I am in love with right is you've taken this idea that it's not so much about the three second gratification you get at the end of like hey we solved the mystery as it is about enjoying the entire story and getting the gratification right which i think is true not just of games but of good mysteries right a good mystery doesn't tie it all together at the end and make us say ah and we hate the tedium of it you know getting there a good mystery we love getting there too and that moment so I, I really love that idea of of what you've done here and it does feel really unique and really appropriate for powered by the apocalypse is there a favorite moment that you've had from this while playing this game like this sort of structure I think my my favorite moment was uh, so I had my group going. This was at Metatopia years and years ago, and this was an off book play test where we were all burnt and we we just wanted to play a game. We we didn't want to give you know our our official points or none of that. So we sat down and we just played. The funny thing is, I this is one of the few where I don't remember who did it or or why they did it because it didn't really matter. The table just had fun playing as the characters. Uh, there was one guy who played the weird one. The weird one is like your, your shaggy type character. And, and their animal mascot was, I think it was a bear. And he just did this whole soliloquy where he was doing the voice of the bear and himself. And it was just them in the back of the van talking about donuts. Like, like that right there is what I live for. That was beauty. That, that was that was it. And that kind of moment, right? Like, that's what you expect if you're playing a game called Jinkies that is harnessing some of the greatest animated entertainment of all time, shall we say? So uh, tell me about sort of the, the genesis of this idea. I know we, we covered this a little bit in the intro. I'd love to talk about how this came about, you know, because I do think I've seen actually people ask for this specific idea online, like a powered by the apocalypse. You know, I've seen people say like, could you use monster of the week to run it? And then people go, ah, you know, monster of the week's a little too deadly. Not really what you're going for in that more uh, hijinks kind of world. So, you know, how did this come about and how did you, come up with the idea like this is what it needs to be to get that cartoony feel okay so the the game started out with uh we we had a group that we were that we were doing and we had just started our group and uh stephanie was our our game master and she had an emergency she had to leave uh for a few weeks and and so we were like crap we need something to do and i said you know what i bet the partridge family would make a great game so I took a copy of Spirit of Spirit of Seventy Seven, um, which, if you haven't played it, uh, Dave K's game is is really fun. And I just scratched out the names of the thing. I'm like, no, 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 this isn't the the tough. This is the leader, and this is the. And I just said, all right, guys, we're 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 doing we're doing a mystery uh, adventure '70s cartoon, and it went pretty well. Uh, I dumped the whole uh, Partridge Family 
bit because of, uh, I, I went and I rewatched it and it's terrible. It would be a great game if, if you were playing as, uh, who was it? Davy was the least. Yeah. If you're any other character, you're, you're just like window dressing. So I'm like, all right, I mean, okay. Not the Partridge family, but like, like, you know, the other mystery adventure cartoons, like they were, they were still bands. Most of them were. So I'm like, okay, we can keep that like family band kind of theme going. And then I, I dumped the band thing more or less and said, let's focus on the mystery and the adventure. So kind of a, kind of a weird uh, evolution from where it started to where it is now, but it, it's worked out pretty well. So yeah, definitely. A- have you done a lot of uh, research for this? You know, have you done a lot of uh, watching and of these cartoons and reading about cartoons and that sort of thing? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so when I was a kid, we we were a my, we were a Hanna Barbera family. I, I don't know any other way to to say that. Like, like we didn't really watch Looney Tunes. We didn't really watch Disney cartoons because you needed the Disney Channel. But we got whatever channel all the the Hanna Barbera cartoons came in on. And so I I've actually seen Speed Buggy, and uh, I used to watch Grape Ape, and I used to watch all of these. Hokey uh, uh, Deputy Dog. Oh, my God. He was great. Uh, all of these hokey, uh, goofy things when I was a kid. And then, yeah, I, I rewatched uh, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You?, which was the 1969 original Scooby-Doo run. Uh, I watched Josie and the Pussycats. I rewatched that. Uh, Gem- I rewatched Gem and the Holograms. I-, I was disappointed by that because it wasn't what I had hoped it would be. And and I remembered it being like the other cartoons, but it's it's not. It's It's a different... Uh, really a different genre. So yeah, I uh, got to watch a lot of cartoons. Uh, did did a lot of research, uh, reading online about uh, about the the cartoons and and why they are the way they are, which which actually was really informative. Like like uh, the original Scooby Doo run, Scooby Doo was the first mystery adventure cartoon that that Hanna Barbera did, and the reason that they made it was their their lineup was like the Herculoids and Birdman and and all of these like super combaty cartoons and and parent groups in the 1960s were shutting down those violent cartoons because they were just you know like meaningless violence and so they had to come up with something and they stole all of the characters from uh, the many loves of Dobie Gillis which was a popular TV show back then and so so that's why the show was so focused on the characters is. Uh, the draw was the characters that like, like you love Shaggy because Shaggy is Maynard G Krebs and people love Maynard G Krebs. Uh, you, you're kind of lukewarm about, about Fred because he's, he's Dobie Gillis. No one really liked Dobie Gillis. So yeah, uh, that, that was very informative to me too. And I, I said, Hey, you know, maybe we should uh, take the character archetypes and those should be the playbooks which is something that has held out to the current design. Don't go anywhere. There's more Tabletop Babble coming up. Hey there, listeners. It's Shane and Ishan, your hosts from the Total Party Thrill podcast, the newest addition to the Don't Split the Podcast network. We talk topics that help you, dear listener, create and play better RPG games. We have a back catalog of more than 150 weekly episodes. And we got nominated for an Emmy for episode 11, Social Contracts. In episode 154, we talked about crossing the moral event horizon, how evil is too evil? We also recap our home games, like the 40k Rogue Trader campaign, Dynasty Unwarranted. Um, but that's mainly just you trying to kill us all. But in your defense, our characters are greedy idiots. Don't forget the three years we spent never on playing Morning Glory, your 5th edition D&D campaign. We also review new RPGs and books, and every episode we build a 5th edition D&D character in the Character Creation Forge. You might check out the Pint Size Punisher from episode 119, a halfling with a bad attitude and 14 levels of Barbarian. So to recap, Total Party Thrill, RPG advice, campaign recaps, and D&D characters built by your dashing hosts every single week. What more could you possibly want? To get back to the actual show? Oh yeah, let me just hit this button, and here you go. All right, back to the show. When we talk about structuralism in games, I think this is one of those things where you really thought about it and you've really made it work and you've really made it work with the theme. Stephanie, you know, I think even when I talk to other designers, we don't talk about structuralism so much. Why is it such an important thing? Structuralism is how we tell a story. So 
you can tell a story that doesn't have structure, but nobody's going to be terribly interested in it unless they have other reasons to be interested in it because, you know, you're engaging just no matter what you say or, or they're looking for something else in what you have to say. But, but when we're telling a narrative story, structuralism is how we understand that story. And that's a cultural thing. I know that there are cultures where uh, the structure is different than it is here in the West. But for, for the most part, at least, you know, here in the, in the Western world, um, we expect our stories to, to fit a certain structure. Um, we expect them to have a beginning, middle and end. And if there's flashbacks, that's okay. And if there's flash forwards, that's okay. But if, if the whole story takes place at, for example, the exact same time, then you have to really work hard to, to present that story uh, in a way that is meaningful and coherent, right? One of the interesting things I've seen happen in games that I have, that I've played and games I've run is that uh, the heroic journey structure, which is that, that, you know, great Western mythological, you know, the, the Uber myth that Joseph Campbell documented fairly heavily. It's, it's not the only structure you can have, but it is a, it is a very popular one in epic storytelling. Um, and when we are playing tabletop RPGs where we have a, you know, we're, we're, we're basically telling a narrative story. We fall back on that one a lot because it's the, it's the big epic. And the problem with the hero's journey and, and the tabletop gaming experience is that the hero's journey is hero, apostrophe S, journey, one hero. And what you have at the table is maybe five heroes, and they all are the center of the story because they all have their own story that they are the important character in. So when you um, try to adapt the hero's quest to narrative, uh, to a, a, a tabletop RPG, for example, um, one of the things that I've seen work with greatest success is if rather than uh, grouping the whole group of heroes together and just considering them as like one, you know, homogenous heroic entity and, and all of the beats in a hero's quest happen to all of them. Um, that's, that's interesting and it works fine. Uh, but what really works amazingly well is if many of the beats happen to one character at a time. So for example, the Campbell structure, you know, there, there might be the gift from the goddess, right? Uh, if that happens to the ranger in the party, right, where they have some special moment with a dryad who gives them an enchanted wooden bow, that is so much more meaningful than the dryad meets all five party members and offers the bow to, quote, them. Uh, and I was in a campaign once where this happened on accident. Uh, there are some really dark things that happen in that in that structure, and one of them is dismemberment of the hero. And we were we were towards the end of the campaign, and things were getting really dire and and very serious. And one of the party members lost an arm. Right there, right then, it was it was very like it suddenly brought home the epicness of what we were doing, and um, uh, the campaign it came to its its conclusion, its big epic com conclusion, not long after that. But it was very it was very cool the way that that you know that had happened to one PC, uh, you know, one party member rather than to all of us, you know, and the rest of us like had to had to sort of you know absorb that uh energy kind of as adjacent figures so um i don't know if that answered your question but it was a really fun <laughs> digression uh <laughs> so yes i love structuralism in uh in rpgs and i love when it's done well and so when when i see it when i see it being done well i i get really excited uh, and by the way, this is not the only game that Toby has written that uses structuralism. Like, like it, 
it's, I think it's, Toby, I'd say it's part of your fingerprint when you, when you touch a game. One of the, uh, I would say challenges, I guess, with, with Jinkies is, uh, like she said, the, the hero's journey is about one person. It's, it's, you know, Marduk defeating the Tiamat. It isn't Marduk and his pals. Uh, if he has pals, his pals are helpers. And that isn't, that isn't how this genre works. So, so in this case, I, I had to change the, uh, the formula because, because it is a group thing. Certain things happen to certain members of the group. Uh, a really good example of this would be a, a, if you've seen the movie Cabin in the Woods. Uh, Cabin in the Woods follows all of the archetypes from Jinkies, and and but they're in a horror setting, and and these are common in in horror, by the way. Uh, and then it's it's again, it's the same thing. What is the role of the weird one in the group? What does he provide? What does he do? Uh, what what is the role of of the attractive one? And the attractive one isn't always always female, by the way. That that's something that we wrote into the game. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, a very attractive guy. Uh, what does the leader do? The leader doesn't, doesn't take the hero's journey per se. The, the leader is just one of the, the cogs in this wheel. So in this case, there is a structure. It's a little bit different than Campbell's because it is fractured out into, uh, typically it's into five different people. We, we try to follow that as well. I, I don't know if that makes sense or, or if I'm just rambling, but. I, it actually, it makes perfect sense to me. And I, you know, I really dig what y'all are saying too about sort of the hero's journey and having a leader character doesn't mean they are the lead character. You know, I think about all of the great shows that we watch that have ensemble casts where there's a clear captain or leader or something like that. But that person isn't the focus of every single episode, right? Right. Like it's like, it's like Seinfeld. If you watch Seinfeld, mm-hmm. Jerry Seinfeld is arguably the least interesting character of the cast. Yeah. <laughs> like, like they don't call it the Kramer show, but because, you know, it, it follows the life of Jerry Seinfeld, but it's, he, he's just the leader because that's his role, not because it's his story. Mm-hmm. So, you know, hopefully uh, for this game, what it, what it means is that uh, someone can have a really compelling time being the smart one. Uh, or perhaps they could have a really good time being the animal mascot or, or the, 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 the looker, I think is what I called that playbook or the talent or the talent. I had a blast <laughs> playing the talent. Yeah. Cause that's, that's a different role. So originally we made it with, with the core four plus one. So you had the leader, you had the attractive one, the, the looker, you had the weird one. And then, and then I said, you know what? There should be more choices in this. So I added in the tough one. Uh, the tough one is is another common uh, archetype that you see in ensemble movies, uh, like like in the Goonies. There's a tough one. Also in every boy band ever. Yeah, boy bands were another big inspiration because they follow the same group dynamic. And then I also had the talent, and the talent was based on a game where I, that I played where Stephanie was playing the smart one. But she was like, no, no, we're a band, and I'm the one who's good. I'm the talent. I got this. And the rest of these guys, they're just like hangers on. They suck. They, they're just like riding my coattails, man. And I, and I was like, you know what? That's good enough that it could be a playbook. I'm going to make that a playbook. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> I, I Even in the description of the moves, like I included Stephanie's disdain for the other players. <laughs> Like how she's kind of looking down at them like, oh, my God, I can make anyone sound good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was really Uh-oh. fun to write. And in fact, when I was proofreading that stuff uh, earlier this week, I cracked up when I got to the talent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's always, it's always nice when you go back and you reread something that you wrote a year ago and it makes you laugh. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I was rolling. <laughs> the, the, whole, the whole thing. But, but that, that playbook – and the weird one in particular really tickled me. That is really great. I love to hear stories about that, how things come alive through playtesting and and how you get ideas from other people because so much of game design is collaboration, right? Because it's a thing you're going to be collaborating while you uh, do, you know, you this is an activity that you do with other people. Uh, you collaborate to tell a story and... One of the things that uh, Stephanie has also told me is that you've developed some special rules 
Toby, for people who are playing with math and literacy issues, which I think is great. Uh, there's a big barrier to people playing these games who have these issues. Uh, you know, I, I have some friends who have dyslexia and getting them into role playing games is hard. Uh, so what have you done to tackle that? Right. So that's, uh, I, I'm a special ed teacher. Um, and that's that one of the things that, that bothered me is that my game is not something that my students could play. Not, not because of content, but because uh, they would not be able to do the math because of dyscalculia. That that's trouble with with numbers, or they couldn't just couldn't read the moves. So what I'm working on is, and and it isn't done yet. Uh, most of the book is done, but that part is not. Is I I figured out a way to uh, simplify apocalypse math to coin flips, and it roughly approximates uh, the probability that you would get from rolling dice. Um, and then also uh, with the moves, I'm, I'm working on. I'll have to pare the moves down a bit, but but uh, replacing them with with icons, like like instead of searching for clues, you'd see like a magnifying glass. And the the hope is that again is that my students would be able to play. Uh, it, it's heartbreaking to me that a kid who can't read is just forever barred from this from this hobby because. Uh, many of my students are very intelligent young people. They just have a, a disability with reading words or, or with with numbers, and I, I don't think that should be disqualifying. And that, that's something that I'm really excited to to be putting in there. Uh, again, it'll be it won't be in the quick start, but uh, that will be in the final product. I'm hoping. I love that a lot. It's, it's something that I hope more game designers think about in the future too. It's really cool. So let's uh, let's get into it. Uh, who else is working on this? What other wonderful artists, designers, that sort of thing can we expect to be on Jinkies? No one, no one can, no one can mess with this. Get off my lawn. It's a, it's a one All man those kids show. Get off my, no, so I've got uh, uh, Steph here is a project manager by trade. That's what she does at Roll Twenty, and she is very generously managing my project and not complaining to me about managing me, which. Uh, I think it's a very kind thing to do. I'm a little bit unmanageable. Uh, we also have, uh, Steph, are we able to talk about the stretch goals? We can talk a little bit. I mean, they're not announced yet, but. Well, okay. So for art, uh, I have an, a wonderful artist. Her name is Lil Chan. And she, she is the only artist that I was able to find who can who can satisfactorily draw something in a 1970s style. She's she is just wonderfully uh, diverse in her talent, her ability to to draw different characters, and I'm I'm really excited to have her. Uh, really really glad that that she said yes to the project. As far as our stretch goals, uh, Steph is going to be doing a uh, a stretch goal. Uh, she's going to be doing a setting. We got uh, the very talented Banana Chan, who is uh, largely known in in LARP circles. But she was an early playtester, loved the game, uh, and we just kind of kept in touch. She's going to be doing a setting as well. And then Dave Kay from Monkey Fun Studios. Uh, they're the guys who brought you Spirit of 77 or uh, Bedlam Hall. He is also going to be a stretch goal for one of our adventures. Nice. That's a, that is a great list of people. Yeah, we got talent. Yeah, you do. You do. We, we do, man. You, you got to get to that Kickstarter page right now because, man, the talent here. It is, it is just off the charts. So if people do want to uh, learn more about Jinkies, where should they go and what should they do? Well, they should definitely go to the Kickstarter page. I do not have a web page, so that would, be a, that would be probably the first and last place to go. After the Kickstarter is over and uh, after Jinkies is uh, in fulfillment, it will also be available on DriveThruRPG. Uh, in both print and PDF, uh, at least that's the goal. So, uh, if anybody's listening to this, you know, six months or a year from now, uh, when we're you know after we're recording it, uh, if you go to the Kickstarter page, you you might find a button that sends you to to buy it directly from Drive Through. But um, but yeah, for for right now, the Kickstarter is the, our main point of contact and probably the best and most reliable way to get in touch with Toby about the project. I love that. That's awesome. Well, 
I think that is going to uh, do it for this episode of Tabletop Babble. But before we go, uh, where can people find you on the internet, Stephanie? Since apparently Toby cannot be found. (laughs) So uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm kind of on Facebook, um, a little bit less these days. And I'm on um, DriveThru, of course. Uh, on drive through you can find me as Stephanie Bryant or if you search for threadbare RPG you'll find you'll find threadbare um, on Twitter I'm Mortain and uh, I think that's also my name on Facebook as well my Facebook's pretty it's 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 pretty locked down so Twitter's probably the the easiest way for somebody who doesn't already know me to reach me so Toby where can people find you on the internet well, they, they can find me on Google Plus until uh, the Google Plus apocalypse. When that occurs, I will not be able to be reached because Google Plus will be dead. Uh, you can also reach me through, uh, through Stephanie Bryant's uh, Twitter account, which is uh, Mortain. <laughs> Nice. Nice. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much for joining me today on Tabletop Apple. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, James. Hey, everybody. Thank you so, so much for listening. That was a great conversation with my pals, Toby and Stephanie. You know, Tabletop Babble is still a new show, and you can help it grow. How? Head on over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. Seriously, even if you're not using iTunes, odds are your podcatcher app is using the iTunes algorithms to rate and recommend a podcast to other people. It's free to create an account. We will thank you. All of the other podcasts you love will thank you if you go leave us a rating. And if you leave us a five-star review, I will read it out loud and credit the person who left it. Like Tomvis, who is from the Netherlands, who left a review that says, great resource for DMs and players of D&D and beyond. Upside down, smiley emoji. So check that out. Thank you so much for this review, Tomvis. I really, really appreciate it. Hey, people, do you like me? Well, guess what? You can listen to me DMing an actual play podcast with an adventure that I wrote. It's called The Demon Plague. Go check it out. It's over at don'tslitthepodcastnetwork.com. We stream it. We YouTube it. We podcast it. So you can find it in almost any format you love and want to check out. I've got great players. Plus, you can hear all about The Demon Plague, which is the level 1 through 20 adventure that I wrote with John Four. It's available in PDF and print and so many other great formats. Go check it out. All right, people, you can find me on Twitter at James Intracasso, and you can check out my blog, worldbuilderblog.com, where I talk about game design, I give DMing advice. It's kind of like this podcast, but, you know, in blog form. So go check it out. Tabletop Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding it with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Don't forget, RPGs are like sex. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to remind you that this episode of Tabletop Babble you just listened to was brought to you by Cobalt Press. Now, listen. I talk about Cobalt Press a lot. They are a sponsor. I have done work for them. But before all of that, they were a game company that I truly loved and respected. And I still do. Why? Because they put the work in. Cobalt Press is run by Wolfgang Bauer, who is a pro in the industry. He's worked for Wizards of the Coast. He still works in games all the time, both with Cobalt Press and outside of Cobalt Press. You definitely want to check it out. Deep Magic is awesome because they play test it. They get artists that are incredible. They get editors that are amazing. They have awesome designers who you have listened to on this show before. You are going to want to check out all of their great stuff at cobaldpress.com. Deep Magic is just the tip of the sweet, sweet cobaldy iceberg. So go check it out.